So if you remember, the boxes should be the names and what they're doing, all right, so the lobes, and then this should be the function and that should be the damage. So the blue bit is what goes wrong if it occurs damage. We've got one of the lobes in the wrong places. Let me spot which one it is. Yeah, what's that? Yeah, where should temple go? I need some more in the green bubbles, please. So you need to be able to tell me what those areas do and then what happens if they're damaged. Yeah, that's right, can you Come on, ladies. This is an essay question on your senior assessment. Rather than all just standing there and watching Kareem, can we not contribute anything else? Don't know any of the other cortexes or areas or what they do. just in front of the somatosensory. sensory nope. Any other than M? Emma? No. Motor cortex. So in the green, Mia, Beth, what does the motor cortex do for you and what will happen if it's damaged? Um, mm -hmm. Well then, it's written down. <coughs> So whoever's put somatosensory in that top left hand corner, what happens if your somatosensory gets damaged? Mm -hmm. Numbness, all right, so you know that one. Okay, and if Broca's area is responsible for speech production, what's gonna happen if that gets damaged? In the blue, what are you saying, Beth? Because it's like slurred speech. Yeah. of what kind of movements they like. Fine movements. So you can't have fine movements. Right, take a seat. Let's see how much more we can get out with you. We've got one giant cortex missing at the bottom. There should be some white bars already out, but just make sure that you're jotting your notes down on the white bars as we go through it. So you've got your frontal lobe, which houses the motor cortex, which is responsible for movement, and if it gets damaged, then obviously your fine movements get uh, disrupted. Just behind that is the somatosensory cortex, which is responsible for sensations, and if you uh, experience uh, damage to the somatosensory cortex, you're going to get numbness in whichever bit it is that's damaged. Now, there's something, oh no, it's not missing, we've got it. Who filled that little space in there? Who was that? Was that you, Corrine? So, Corrine said, the more space taken up in a specific area of the somatosensory cortex, the more sensitive that area is. Do any of you know which part of your body have the biggest parts of your somatosensory cortex? Mm -hmm. Your lips is one of them, your hands and your genitals, all right? So your lips, uh, your tongue, your hands and your genitals. So if they get damaged, those bits uh, that wind all across the top of your uh, parietal lobe there, if they get damaged, then you'll get numbness in any of those areas. Um, so that's sometimes why 
Um, I don't know if anybody's ever experienced it, but if you have had a whack right to the top of your head, you do feel a bit tingly and a bit numb. Has anybody ever had that before where you get a bit of numbness? It might be, it depends where kind of it's hit you. So we've got those two, right? Moving into the back, you've got the occipital lobe. Um, which is responsible largely for visual behaviours. So primary visual area and secondary visual area. Secondary visual area, who said that? Is responsible for producing face blindness. Can anybody remember what that is? Prosopagnosia is the right word for it. What's trying to yeah, no, so you can see an object but you can't see any facial features. So it's more sophisticated um, than the primary visual area because it's not just in the occipital lobe. On your whiteboards, which other two areas would you find it in? So the secondary visual area, it's not necessarily on this diagram here, but it's in the occipital, but two others as well. You need some pens. You don't have to write them all down individually, you can work together. Well, that one was right to start with, yeah. Temporal, definitely. And then, I think you've got it as well, Kareem? Parietal, all right. So it's located across all three of those areas of our brain. So it can basically identify what something is and attach meaning to it as well as just seeing it. Um, then down here, We've got Wernicke's area and Broca's area, all right, which are both absolutely fine. So Wernicke's area is responsible for speech comprehension um, and Broca's area is responsible for speech production. But nobody has actually said what this cortex would be then. Begins with an A. If it's all to do with speech, hearing speech and producing speech, what is the cortex? Auditory, all right, so the auditory cortex, okay? So, what I, why I wanted to start with this with you is because this could be a 16 mark essay or an 8 mark essay, okay? You've got to know how to actually kind of answer the questions in relation to this section. So, the first sheet that you need in front of you is the one with Broca and Wernicke on it, all right? So, if the question was discussion of localization, the knowledge, all right, or your AO1 content would be just describing those functions. So what we've just had up on the board would just be your description, okay? These are the different areas of the brain and this is what they're responsible for and this is what happens if they get damaged. The discussion element of it comes from Broca and Wernicke's early research and then all the commentary that goes with it. So I want to see what you can remember. Have a go in, in that little huddle there, see how much of this you can fill in. So what were the early cases reported by Wernicke and Broca? What could and couldn't the patients do? Where was their damage? What was the conditions called? Are there any methodology issues with these early studies that have been provided? Is there any other evidence? And I've given you a hint, the study's called Peterson, but what kind of a study was it? And then why is their methodology better than theirs? And then lastly, a bit of contradictory stuff from Lashley. So, like I say, this is on your CEDA assessment. Let's see what you can actually write down. Have you actually been back over this? <laughs> You don't have to sit there and talk to it. I appreciate that you find it hard. That's kind of why I'm doing it.
we've only got to add on two extra letters. Front. Front. Yeah. Okay, so I can see most of you have now done that table, but what about all the rest of it? Okay, remember this is a 16 mark essay, so it's not enough to just have those hidden little bits of supporting evidence, what else can you tell me? So what are the methodological flaws with those early uh, studies? What other evidence have we got in this area that is a bit better, a bit more sophisticated? Okay, I'm going to go through this now then and see what, see what you've put. I'm not having a go at anybody, but this seems to me like this hasn't been revised. Like, if you had revised this, that's, it's not hard, that material. So I'm sensing that there's just a lack of effort, maybe, to revise it. I understand you've got a lot of stuff to do, but you've got to see the, this week. Some of you have got a seed of this week, and this is on it. Right? I know obviously that's the reason why I'm running this revision session, because it's, it's a difficult area for some of you, but there's some people who can't write a single thing down without looking around. It's not great. So let's see what you've got then. So, Wernicke's research. Emma, can you tell me what goes in these three columns? So what could or couldn't they do in the Wernicke case studies? Um, they couldn't comprehend speech and problem instructions. Very good. All right, what was the damage? Um, to the left temporal Left temporal lobe, thank you. And well, what's that called? Uh, is it Wernicke's aphasia? Very good. So Wernicke's aphasia. And then Rocker's aphasia. Um, Beth, can you do that one for me? Um, if that one I could read, but not speak. Yeah, you can only speak one word. Can you remember what that word was? It does begin with a T. It's what you get on holiday. Tan. All right. So the only word that he could say was tan. Okay. Uh, so he could understand things. He, he could read things. He could follow instructions, but he could not speak, and he could only could say one word. Where was the damage, Beth? Very good. Which side? Left, left is language. So left frontal lobe for Broca's area, and what is that condition called? Um, 
Anybody know that one? It's not just Brock as a phase here, it's got a word in between it. Mm -hmm. with an E. If you can speak properly, you are able to do what? No? It's called expressive aphasia. So Brocker's expressive aphasia. Again, this is just bog standard stuff, girls. This is not good, this at all. Right, what are the methodological issues with these early studies? Now, most of you have said that the case studies, that's not actually what's in the booklet at all. It's not the fact that they are unique individuals, it's the fact that they were post-mortem studies, all right? And that the damage to their brains was not experimental. It wasn't manipulated by the researchers. So if the IV, i.e. the damage to those areas of the brain has not been manipulated, then you can't establish cause and effect, all right? So those early post-mortem studies do not have the same sort of uh, internal validity as what the later, more scientific research has, all right? There's all these issues with establishing causality. So I asked you, is there any other evidence? And I told you it was provided by Peterson. And we know what kind of evidence it was? Okay. No? Come on. One of you must know this. What kind of evidence? If they were early post mortems in the 1800s, scientific. they were scientific. scientific. What other method do we use to see what's going on in your brain? You should see what's going on in your bloody brain right now. Thank you. Pet scans. PET scans, thank you very much. So Peterson conducted PET scans. So PET scans, they show us what? What do PET scans show us? Right, okay, so the Peterson study showed um, acti activity in areas of the brain when participants were completing specific uh, tasks or functions. So you had two different kinds of tasks that were being completed. So one task was a reading out loud task, the other one was a listening task. On your whiteboards, all right, if you can just tell me which areas would light up in each of those tasks. So reading out loud and then listening. So reading out loud, which area would that be? And then listening, which area would that be? Okay. So, speech comprehension is located in Wernicke's area. So which of the tasks would that be? Listening, all right, so the listening task, according to Peterson, would light up Wernicke's area, suggesting that that area in the left temporal lobe is responsible for speech comprehension, i.e. it's active when we are listening to things. When we are asked to read something out loud, that evidence showed that the PET scan indicated that the Broca area in the left frontal lobe was now active. So, why is their methodology better? On your whiteboard, which feature of science does that have that that does not? Okay, so think about your features of science. Which one do PET scans have that postmortems don't? Let's see what you're saying. Okay, so replicability, you could say that, all right, because you can just kind of keep going with the same standardised uh, procedures in terms of your methodology of a PET scan. However, the best one is, Emma? Objectivity. Objectivity, all right. So there's no difficulty in establishing causality um, because you are manipulating things. You are giving them tasks to do and then seeing which areas the brain are lighting up. So they're highly scientific, they're way more objective, which means we've got a better 
kind of like chance of establishing some sort of validity from the findings. So there are methodological issues with the early post-mortem studies. However, there is some scientific evidence kind of over the years to demonstrate that what Brocker and Wernicke originally said was absolutely spot on. It's just that they didn't do it in a very scientific way. But then we got a final contradictory piece of evidence from Lashley, um, which was about rats running inside of a maze. Now, can anybody remember what that piece of research said? It contradicted the idea of localization. Joanna, give it a will. Was it when any part of the brain was removed, the rat couldn't like, remember the way around the maze? You're on the right lines, all right. So basically, when they tinkered with the brains of rats, they did lots and lots of different trials and they removed all sorts of different areas of the brain. And no one area of the brain had a more significant impact on the rat's ability to run the maze. Suggesting, can we write it down, girls, please? Because we're all looking a bit blank faced. Suggesting that activity or function is not localised, but instead that the brain and the areas of the brain worked together. What would we call that? Begins with a H. That the functioning of the brain is not localised is instead this bigger picture, everything working together. So, where are you familiar with? We've used it from a theoretical point of view before. If a theory gives you the bigger picture and takes everything into consideration, what would we class it as being? Being with a H. We're all looking like you know it. It's not like a, is it, is it H-O? H-O, yes. Holistic. Holistic, yeah. So the Lashley study uh, indicates that the brain functions in a holistic manner instead, that they all actively work together rather than specific functions being localised to specific lobes and hemispheres of the brain. So I wanted to start with that, okay, because like I said, that's going to be on the cedar, but also this now links in to everything else for the last little bit of uh, biological psychology. So turn it over for me. Um, and you've got an exam question, all right? So those of you who, uh, well, you two, Mia and Kareen, you've been set this as homework, so you should have come across this. Um, an exam question that I'd asked you to have a go at. So Lotta's grandmother suffered a stroke to the left hemisphere, damaging Broca's area and the motor cortex. Using your knowledge of the functions of Broca's area and the motor cortex, describe the problem that Lotta's grandmother would be likely to experience. Just jot down any ideas, please, around it. So what would you put in there? Okay, so you three have already actually done this question in class with me. I said for you two, it was part of your homework, so you should have come across it already. All right, so the Lotto question came up last year, all right, and it's quite um, an interesting, quite a good way to test your knowledge um, of kind of like localization and lateralization. So it says that she's got damage to her left hemisphere, and it says that the damage is in Broca's area, all right, so that's the frontal left hemisphere, and then the motor cortex. So, what should you have actually said? 
Um, this is a sample answer. I'm going to have a look at the mark scheme in a second, but this is a sample answer. Um, the Broca's area is part of the left frontal lobe and is involved in speech production. As Lotta's grandmother has experienced damage to her Broca's area, she's likely to have problems speaking fluently and will experience slow and inarticulate speech. Just raise your hands if you'd said that, all right, that she's going to have slow speech when she's damaged Broca's area. Okay, so that's most of you. And then lastly, furthermore, as she has damaged her left motor cortex, which is responsible for voluntary movements, it is likely she will experience problems on the right hand side of her body. So moving her right arm and her left arm, no, sorry, right arm and leg, as the left regions are responsible for movements on the right side of the body. Raise your hands if you said that bit. One of you, all right? Now let's just have a look at the mark scheme. It says, that there's a maximum of two marks available for answers which only address one area of the brain, all right? So for some of you, that would be you, because you only talked about Broca. Um, and then notice this here. Like I say, this is in all the stuff that I've sent you girls as well, so you don't really have any excuses, it is in there. This point is essential for four marks, that because it's the left side of her brain that is damaged, it will be the right side of her body um, that is, is feeling the, the impairment, all right? So that has got to be said. Now that leads me into the next little chunk. Not only is the brain localised, which means specific parts of the brain do specific things. It is also lateralised, which means that language is entirely on the left hand side of your brain. But we've also got split communication, okay, whereby the right visual field and audio field sends things to the left and vice versa, as illustrated in this exam question, right? So, one of the things that I'd asked you girls to do for homework was the Sperry study. You have already done it. So now get in front of you this, okay? So the Sperry piece of research is there to demonstrate this cross-hemispheral uh, communication, okay? So the split brain theory is this idea that certain functions are controlled by one hemisphere rather than the other. The brain and its functions are split across the different hemispheres. We know that language is on the left, but there are other functions as well which are designated to the different sides, okay? So let's just have a look at those. So on the left hand side, we've not only got language, you've also got analytical thinking, you've got verbal and mathematical functioning, and you've got sequential information processing. In other words, it tells you what tasks to do and in what order. It gives you some semblance of time or sequence. On the right hand side, it's a bit more responsible for our kind of creativity. So uh, a lot of spatial awareness there, all right, so understanding directions, artistic tasks, okay, so uh, a lot of drawing um, and painting kind of comes from that side of things, music recognition as well, um, and face recognition is also on the right hand side. So what happens is that this right visual field communicates information to the left hemisphere of the brain and vice versa. Now, the Sperry study looked at a group of individuals who are called split brains, i.e. they have had their corpus callosum, which is this little fine bit of tissue that connects the two hemispheres together, that has been entirely severed which means there is no communication between the right visual field and the left hemisphere and the left visual field and the right hemisphere. So, on your whiteboard, which side is language located? Quick as you can, in which hemisphere is language located? So language is in the left hemisphere, you're absolutely right. So these patients then, if they were to see something in their right visual field, what would they not be able to do on your eyebrows? So according to Sperry, if they saw something in their right visual field, what would they not be able to do? Okay, so they wouldn't be able to write it down, say what it is, describe it, etc., etc. What would they be able to do then? 
It's been presented to their right visual field. It's not that these people are blind, it's just that this is severed. So whilst they can't say what it is, what would they be able to do? Draw it, understand it, and Joanna, the most obvious one? Point at it. Point at it, all right? So, this was the, the basic premise of the Sperry study. Take a load of individuals who have had, uh, for unfortunate reasons, normally epilepsy, um, severed their corpus callosum, which means cross hemispheral communication is not possible. So, now then, girls, let's have a go at filling in the description. Let's look through this filling in the description of this piece of research. That's just a bit of an illustration as to what was going on in the Sperry study, just like I've described to you there. So now let's try it together. So, what was the purpose of the Sperry study? It was to investigate hemispheric something. What are we talking about here? We want to find out where language is in terms of the brain. What's that called? On one side of the brain? Yeah. Lateralisation, thank you very much. All right, so the Sperry study was to investigate hemispheric lateralisation in, you want to do the next one? Split brain patients, okay? So it was to investigate hemispheric lateralisation in split brain patients to see whether each hemisphere is responsible for different functions, okay? And if the theory was correct, then what we should see is problems with language, okay? So, in A, how do we know the N? Natural experiments, because the severing of the corpus callosum is a naturally occurring variable. So, it's a natural experiment with 11 males, it was in total. And I've already hinted at this, but all of the males had previously been suffering from what? Epilepsy, right? That's normally the reason why you sever your corpus callosum to um, kind of eradicate the electrical activity. Uh, so, 11 males who were all previously diagnosed with epilepsy were asked to complete a series of tasks involving sitting in front of a screen with the ability to freely move their hands. All right, so they're sitting in front of a screen. They're allowed to move their hands and handle or touch objects which are appearing behind the screen, okay? So they can move their hands and they can touch stuff, but they can't see what they are touching because those objects are obscured from sight, okay? So they're all sat behind the screen. So if you just have a look, all right? The whole sat, all sat with this screen in front of them. They can move their hands around, okay, and they can touch objects uh, that are given to them underneath it in most cases. So they're allowed to do that, but most of the time they're hidden from the, their view, okay? So the first set of tasks were classed as. Here we go. What's the V stand for? Visual. And what do we normally present participants with, being with an S? Stimuli. Stimuli, well done, Mia. So visual stimuli testing. So in this first half of the study, the participants are asked to gaze on a fixation point in the middle of a screen. So as you just bring up that image again, you can see it there. That's the fixation point, all right? So they're being asked to look at that fixation point and focus in on it. At that point, all right, whilst they're gazing at the fixation point, a word appears, all right, either, that's supposed to say, sorry, that's just a little error. So a word then appears either to the right or the left of the fixation point. But the trick with this split brain research was to make that reveal really, really short, okay? So you're literally getting them to stare at that tiny little dot in the middle of the screen and then a word flashes up. But it only flashes up for a tenth of a second, all right? So they only get to see this visual information for a tenth of a second. So remember, the visual information is being presented either to the right or the left visual field, okay, for, for only a tenth of a second. 
So, what were the findings in this first visual stimuli set of testing? If a participant was presented with the word key to the right visual field, they would respond in what form? Verbally. Verbally well done. So, if they're uh, presented with the word key to their right visual field, all right, so this scenario here, okay, what they will do is they will respond verbally or in written form with the word key. However, when presented with it in the left visual field, they are unable to respond verbally, all right, because language is located where? In which hemisphere? Left hemisphere, all right, and they can't cross communicate, so therefore the information stops. So they can't verbally respond, but what they can do is draw it, all right? Because we'd said, uh, I'm not going to go back to that image of the brain, but we'd said that located on the right hemisphere of the brain, you've got those artistic, creative uh, talents, okay? So if it's presented to the right visual field, you cannot say what you see, okay? But what you can do is draw the object. What else would they be able to do? You've already said it. You, they could draw it, they could also Emma, point at it, alright? They could point at it or pick it out. Because they've seen it, it's just that they can't get the words out because they don't have that language functionality. So that's the first set of testing. The other set of testing is called tactile stimuli tests. What does the word tactile mean? No, if you're a tactile person, what do you do? which makes people feel uncomfortable a lot of the time. Touch, <laughs> right? So tactile is touching. So the tactile stimuli testing was all to do with touch. So they were presented with an object in, again, either their left or their right hand behind the screen. Underneath, all right? So remember, they can't see these objects. All they can do is feel them. So the findings were... If they had the object placed in their right hand, they could describe the object verbally and in words, all right? So they could do it written form or verbally, just the same as with that. The problem was, when they were presented with it in their left hand, they were unable to verbally describe it, but same thing, they could point to it in a series of correct objects, okay? So given a lineup of pictures, they know that they've seen it, and they can pop, pick it out of that line up, excuse me, but they can't actually say what, they're, say what they're seeing. So, to conclude, and you might want to write some of this around the sides, this isn't in, on your sheet, but to conclude, what we already knew is proved to be true. So each hemisphere is responsible for different functions, which supports hemispheric lateralisation. The left hemisphere, as we already thought, is responsible for language production and the right can recall and identify stimuli. But what it can't do is verbalise it because it doesn't have any language ability. So what we see from this piece of research, this is the bit that you should really write down, is that Sperry showed us each hemisphere is basically like its own brain. Okay, Each side of your brain has different thoughts, they have different feelings, they have different memories, they deal with different types of information. And what they do is they work in isolation rather than integration. Who said the opposite to that? I've already mentioned him today. Who said that your brain's holistic, it's all working together. When you chuck a rat in a maze, it doesn't make a difference which bit of his brain you took out. You remember? Either than L. Lashley, all right. So Lashley said it's holistic. Sperry is saying absolutely not. Okay, the hemispheric lateralization is true isolation, and you can demonstrate that by looking at split brain individuals. So in your booklets, I believe, I'm not sure what page it was, you had a series of questions that you had to answer. Obviously, Karina and Mia, that was part of your homework, and I did actually give you the answers, so just make sure that you've got those in there. Um, the other three, we've already been through those questions. So, now if you just turn it over, we're going to have a look at the discussion points for that piece of evidence. So, that piece of evidence is classed technically 
as a piece of research about split brain patients, all right? However, and you need to just make this stand out or add it on, um, the question might also ask you about evidence of lateralisation and the stuff would be exactly the same, all right? Because split brain research is demonstrating lateralisation and lateralisation is supported by split brain research. So if you ever get one of those two questions, it's always the same material, okay? They, they combine together. And what I've said on the next screen as well, and apologies girls, you've already seen this, um, but what I've also said is you could even use the split brain research if you really wanted to. A lot of students find it hard, but some people crack it and they go, well, I'll use it all the time if I can. You could also use it to show localization because it quite clearly shows that language functioning is located in the left temporal and frontal lobes, all right? So split brain research could crop up all over the place. So what are the evaluation points then that you would refer to here if you've got any question on split brain research, lateralization research, and if you wanted to wheel it out for a bit of localization as well. So the sporting evidence is quite clearly sparing, okay? The reliability, can we add a tick on please, okay? I'm not giving you ticks or crosses at all here. So it is a good thing, all right? It's very, very reliable and I think Emma, it was you who had said before, oh, no, no, it, wasn't, it was you, me, wasn't it? You've gone for replicability, didn't you? For brain scans. So that's what we're saying here, that they are really, really standardised, okay? You can repeat um, procedures such as the Sperry study, I know it's not a brain scan, uh, but you can repeat them in exactly the same conditions. The equipment's highly scientific, you're monitoring everything really carefully, and um, you can use uh, computer programs so that they're only shown those visual images for a, a tenth of a second, and that's the same for everyone. So it's all really heavily standardized, which means if you can replicate it and get the same findings, then this idea that language is lateralized to the left hemisphere is an absolutely reliable one. Did you know that there is not a single piece of research that exists in the world that shows that language is anywhere other than the left-hand side of the brain? And that's because of these procedures, okay? It always gets replicated again and again and again and again, and it comes out that it is located on that left. So it's a very reliable theoretical idea. Furthermore, another tick please in this top right-hand corner. The Sperry research and all the lateralisation research um, is very kind of like useful to us because it uses both types of data. So <clears throat> we've got the kind of use of lab experiment procedures, but you've also got case studies being used here as well. So it's not just kind of like churning everybody through the same mill, it, you've got that kind of unique sensibility about it where you're kind of asking them questions about their own experiences. So it's quantifiable through all the data, but you've also got that qualitative element to it as well. However, down at the bottom here, we've got two criticisms. First one is a classic one, you might want to make that stand out. That the sample is very, very restrictive. Um, number one, they're all blokes. Number two, they're all epileptic. All right? So they should have had a control condition that were non-epileptic individuals. But instead they just used all kind of like epileptics. So a very, very unrepresentative or biased sample. And then the final nail in the coffin, which is a really obvious point to make, is that the study does not reflect in any way, shape or form how people with split brain problems live their life because you don't walk around your everyday life seeing things flash up for a tenth of a second and then it all disappears again. If they were to be able to see the images for long enough, then it's probable that they would be able to live a regular life because things would work in isolation rather, sorry, in integration rather than isolation. The hemispheres normally for split brain patients work a little bit more together than what Sperry would kind of have us believe in this study, all right? 
So, like I've already said, and I've already shown you that next slide, please be aware of the fact that that split brain commentary can be used absolutely all over the place, okay? So your Broca and your Wernicke stuff is to do with localization. The split brain research is to do with lateralization. How could Broca and Wernicke also be used to illustrate lateralization? On your whiteboards, anyway, tell me. How could you also use Broca and Wernicke to show a lateralization of functions? What do they both show? So your main piece of research would be scary, but how could you also use Broca and Wernicke? Yeah. yeah. So both of those pieces of research show that language is lateralised to left hemisphere. So all of these bits of research, can you see girls, they're all kind of overlapping with one another. It's about you understanding kind of how to pick and choose what you want, all right? So put those to one side and then we're just going to have a quick look at the stuff on um, plasticity and functional recovery to finish off. Yes, fine. Well, you were in the lesson for this one, not for yeah. anyway, so you should be all right with it. All right then, so what I've given you here is just a little kind of like essay plan of how I would do it if I was answering this question. So. The question would be, discuss research into plasticity and functional recovery, okay, for 16 marks. Um, I've said here, all right, if you want to just make it stand out, if you've got highlight pens or anything, in this case, don't be confused by that word. We've, we've come across this before, that sometimes in psychology, the word research actually means theory okay so there is no studies for you to describe as part of your knowledge content so your AO1 content more um, you describe it kind of like the theoretical background as part of your research so don't get confused with that that's why I put it in black underneath it so I'm just going to work my way through it and hopefully get all this filled in for you all right so what you would start with on this question would be a definition of plasticity. So you don't have to write it all down in full because you've all got this PowerPoint so you can make uh, additions in your own time. But you can just be bobbing kind of bits and bobs in. So you start with the general definition of what we mean by plasticity. And what it is, okay, is the brain's ability to change over time. All right. So I have been saying this to you since 1st September when I got you and I taught you that the brain is malleable and that it can change and that it's not, you're not born with a fully formed brain, it's always changing. So plasticity is that process, okay? So if you think about it, you ever play with Play-Doh when you were little? That's what we mean by plasticity, all right? Your brain is like a little dollop of Play-Doh that can be moulded and changed and shaped as you transition through your life periods. So the changes when we're experiencing plasticity can take two forms. They can either be structural, which is where, and it sounds bizarre, your brain physically changes. Now that might be as a result of some sort of damage or it might just be the growth process okay so if you think of how teeny tiny your brain is when an infant is born think of all the, the physical structural changes that occur over a very very quick period of time so the structural changes can occur and we're going to look in a little bit more detail at that and then you can also get functional changes so when we started this little session this afternoon i asked you to diagram um oh, sorry label a diagram of a brain and one of the things that you were putting on there was what happened if that area got damaged, okay? So these functions um, can also be affected. So your brain can change structurally, but also functionally. So we're going to take a look now at structural changes 
in a new brain through into adulthood, okay? So we're gonna look at plasticity in newborns. So this image here that you've also got on your big diagrams is an image, it doesn't look you know, like anything, but it's an image of neural connections inside of a brain, okay? So on the left hand side, what you've got, all right, oops, sorry, what you've got on the left hand side is a newborn baby's brain, okay? So what this image depicts here is very, very few neural connections, okay? Virtually none at all, all right? A newborn baby does not get born, all right? We're really underdeveloped as species when we're first born, but a newborn baby has very, very few neural connections. We're little blobs. Well, I've said this to you before, but what are the things that we can actually do when we're born? Cry. Cry. Anything else? What else do babies do? Cry, eat, sleep. And the other one that nobody likes. Well, after they've eaten and they sleep, they then excrete, <laughs> all right? So they poop, sleep, eat, and cry, all right? So they don't got a great deal going for them. So why is that then? Largely, it's to do with the fact that their brains literally don't have any capability to do anything else, okay? Their brain is so teeny tiny when they're born and so underdeveloped, there are no neural structures in there, or very, very few of them. However, fast forward two years and the brain is at its absolute peak in terms of synaptic connections, all right? So, by the age of two years, you have got 15,000 synaptic connections for each neuron. All right? So, over those first two years, your brain is absolutely going through radical transformation. And you two have already taught it too. Can you remember why we said that is? Why is it that newborn babies go through such rapid increase in terms of synapse connections? Can you remember? Is that every experience is a new experience? Absolutely, all right? So every experience, as Emma's just rightly said, every experience is a brand new experience. They are dealing with stimuli that they have never witnessed before, and they've got to try and make sense of everything around them. So that's why the synaptic connections go through the roof, because they're seeing and hearing things and touching and smelling things that they've never seen before. And the brain has got to change to allow them to make sense of it all. However, fast forward again into adulthood, you have lost half of your synaptic connections. All right. So you have 15,000 per neuron at around about the age of two. By your age, or certainly in a couple of years' time, you basically, you've peaked and you've troughed. Your synaptic connections have dropped to around about seven, 8,000. That's because a lot of the stimuli experiences that you have on a day-to-day -day basis are not new to you. The things that you are used to have become established circuits in the brains and they are hardwired. The rest of them have been removed. Now that has got a specific name. It's called, hold on, it's called synaptic pruning, okay? And that's why it looks like kind of like a, an unruly bush, if you want, all right? Weeding out the garden. So we've got nothing in the garden to start with. And it all flourishes, all right, and everything gets a bit chaotic and a bit messy. And then by the time you get into adulthood, the old, unused, weak connections that have no relevance to you, they don't add anything to your experience of this world, they get removed, they get deleted. Which sounds bizarre, that your brain, remember that's what we're talking about, we're talking about a brain, knows to delete a load of neural connections, all right? It's basically like cleaning out one of those, all right? Going through a couple of years and absolutely overloading it with files and then getting to a point where you go, I don't need those anymore, I'll keep the things that I need and cleaning everything out and your brain automatically does it. 
So that is an absolutely superb demonstration of plasticity within the human brain. That it goes through a radical transformation in the first two years and then an even more exceptional transformation into adulthood that it knows to eliminate all those excess connections. So we've got this little description or definition of what's going on. We then need some examples, all right? So I've given you two examples. One is a hemisphere ectomy, which is this idea that your brain is so plastic and so adaptable that you can remove one entire hemisphere of someone's brain and they will live, by and large, a totally normal life, all right? So I've sent you all the video clip. We watched it in lesson, but it's certainly in the group uh, chat anyway. I sent you a video clip of a young girl who had her um, right hemisphere removed. Um, she had a, a full right hemisphere taken out at the age of three. So the brain was kind of pretty fully formed by that point, okay? And she had enough neural connections in her brain to be able to cope with the removal of that right hemisphere. So if um, it had been removed, you would have expected her to lose all sorts of functionality. Um, however, the brain is so amazing and so plastic that any functions that were in one side of the brain, when the hemisphere had been whipped out, they know to go into the other side of the brain, all right? So the neural connections transfer across, okay? And it can recover that functionality, all right? So that demonstrates two things. It demonstrates the structural change, but it also demonstrates that functional change can occur as well. So we've got the hemispherectomy, and then we've got another one which you're already familiar with, which is a bit less extreme than this, but the Maguire study. Can anybody remember what happened in the Maguire study without me going through it with you? Right, so what's to do with taxi, dri taxi drivers and their memory? Which part of their brain was it dealing with? The hippocampus. And what did it show about the hippocampi of a taxi driver? It was bigger, alright? So, remember, plasticity is all about change, alright? It's about how your brain is different over time. So, the Maguire study, just to fast forward it a little bit, We've already said it demonstrated that in um, a taxi driver who had been learning the knowledge, um, this ability to whiz through London and just instinctively know all of the different routes, their hippocampus was twice as big as the average control. Okay. Um, however, we see that they're anterior, so you've got posterior and anterior. Let me know what those two words mean. Posterior and anterior. Yeah. Forwards and backwards. Yeah, which one's which? Anterior is forwards, posterior is backwards. Yeah, alright, so your anterior hippocampus is the front and your posterior hippocampus is the back. So their anterior hippocampus um, was smaller. So, visual, this is bizarre, this. Visual memory was reduced, spatial memory was increased. So, if you ask them to visualise what was on that route, they'd find it more difficult. But tell them to get you from one place to the other place, and they can do it. All right? So that sounds bizarre. But their visual memory is significantly impaired. All right? So they don't necessarily remember seeing specific things, but they know the routes. They know the spatial uh, relationships of any given route, okay? So that's, like I say, a second example to illustrate it. So that would be all of your AO1 credit there. So starting off with the definition, talking about how the um, in, infant brain changes into adulthood, and then popping a couple of examples on the end. You'd then go straight into 
the evaluation material. I've split the evaluation material in half here. So we're just going to now take a look at that first little bit of evidence. So we do have supporting experimental evidence as well. Not only have we got these real life, excuse me, real life examples and case studies, there is supporting evidence. So playing video games demands complex cognitive motor skills. What has been shown in um, research such as the Coon study in 2004 is that grey matter in the cortex, hippocampus and cerebellum are significantly, can you underline it please, increased in those participants who have been training to play Super Mario for 30 minutes a day for two months. So a lot of people wrongly assume that plasticity is just these really weird and wonderful people who have had really odd and unusual experiences in their life. Absolutely not. If I made you all train for 30 minutes a day for two months, your brain would change too, okay? So you would get more synaptic connections uh, being formed in your brain and it would just happen because you, your brain is malleable and what it's doing is it's, it's building, you can see here, that's the key word, it's building on the demands being placed upon it. So if it requires more cognitive and motor skills, then you're going to need some more synaptic, um, commu synaptic connections to allow you to deal with it. Basically, that's the same as a baby brain, all right? It's something new to an adult that they've got to learn how to adapt to. It's exactly the same as what a child is going through. So we would put in the supporting evidence. What we would also put in at this point is the practical applications as well, okay? So there has been a lot of kind of real world implications from all this plasticity stuff. And what it's shown us about the brain is absolutely staggering. So the first one you might be familiar with um, is just basically rehabilitation. And I think I mentioned this to you anyway when I taught you um, the Maguire study. I'd said that it had led to breakthroughs in terms of being able to treat people who had suffered strokes. Because if we know that the hippocampus is involved in memory, then you basically need to massage or make active the hippocampus and they will recover. So you need to write this down, girls, the space on your sheets for it. Not in masses of detail, like I say, you've already got this, so you can add to it at a later point. But like I say, I use the word massage, electrical stimulation of the areas of the brain that you know have been affected can counter those deficits. And that's only since we've discovered that the brain is plastic, all right? That it, it can make structural changes. Is it actually plastic? No, it's not actually <laughs> plastic. <laughs> not actually plastic. Do you know, I looked, before we broke up for the half term, I looked to have a guy, I actually emailed him to see if somebody would come in and do a load of brain dissections with you all, you know, like as a, have a day off timetable but the cost that the guy was charging, I asked Suzanne and it was just like, no, no, Fiona, that's not going to be happening. I did think about asking you what if you wanted to pay for it, if it helped you understand it, but then I thought, no, I'm too tight, I probably won't want to do that. I'd do it. Would you? Yeah. yeah. To get a, get a guy come in and dissect some brains? Yeah. yeah. I think it was £8 per eight person. Oh, that's fine. Yeah. £8 to look at a brain? To, that, to actually dissect one, you get to dissect it. Yes. Yeah. I, don't I, don't know, I think most people do enjoy that. Huh? I think most people do enjoy that. All right. Well, I'll, I'll ask everyone and see, and see if the guy will come in and maybe he may have to. Maybe sort it out there. Anyway, sidetracked. So, uh, rehabilitation is the easy point to make. The second point to make, and when I taught it to your class, not everybody was familiar with it, um, but the concept of stem cell research is taking off um, massively kind of in the last few years. So stem cells um, come usually from kind of like fetal matter. Um, they are stem basically cells which can be reassigned to specific areas and specific functions. 
So stem cell research may in the future make neuronal transplantation possible, whereby you can take some stem cells and implant them into a damaged area and potentially grow them into self-sufficient neurons on their own. Okay, If you can take fully functional stem cells and put them into a damaged area, then we might be able to stop certain diseases developing. So there are two main diseases, you can just about make it out there, um, to do with uh, transferring our stem cell transfer, tra stem cell transfers. So Alzheimer's is one, do we know any of the other ones? Stem cell research. It's one that we've talked about a lot already today where you could change the connections in the brain. Yeah, yeah, right? So it, it can be used all over the shop. Primarily, they're doing it with um, Alzheimer's, some tentative work going on at the moment. But because we know that these neurons are so adaptable and so flexible, specifically these stem cells, you can take them out and put them into a damaged area and they will become self-sufficient themselves, right? they will make their own neural connections. So we've got the supporting experimental evidence and we've also got the practical applications at this point. We then going to now have a look at um, the functional recovery stuff, okay? So following it round on your big A3 sheet, we need a definition of functional recovery and we need the types of functional recovery that could occur, okay? So, for the definition of functional recovery, you basically need to be saying that the brain can experience damage normally due to injury or illness, okay? So if you want to just write that down, guys, all right? So over the course of a lifetime, the brain can incur damage usually due to illness or injury. But that it can recover, all right? It can recover any functions that have been lost. So when I was teaching it, I got students to actually write down some examples that you've done so far over the course of this last two years nearly um, that you're already familiar with. So whilst I haven't ever taught you anybody who's experienced a stroke, I have taught you case studies of people who have experienced physical traumas to the brain and have managed to recover, and then viral and bacterial infections. That guy unfortunately didn't make a recovery, but it's still quite an astounding case. So does anybody know who I'm talking about? Physical trauma, who is absolutely fine. Quite severe physical trauma. If you saw him walking down the street, you'd be like, how are you not dead? Oh, uh, uh, Phineas Gage. Phineas Gage, alright. So Phineas Gage experienced massive physical trauma straight up through his kind of nasal, through his cranium, frontal lobe, back of his eye socket, out the top of his brain, and he was fine, alright. Talking all the way through it. Slight changes to his personality, but other than that, he was absolutely fine. Um, and then we've got several people who have experienced kind of viral bacterial infections. The main one is live wearing. So, what happens when your brain experiences these illnesses or these injuries? When we go through that kind of damage to the brain, it can recover, and it recovers in one of three ways, all right? The first one is really easy, it's called axonal sprouting. So you remember that image that I showed you about 15 minutes ago where you'd pruned the bushes, all right? So ax axonal pruning, all right? Getting rid of all those excess synaptic connections. Axonal sprouting is the opposite. Basically, you've weeded the garden out and all the connections have died external sprouting is replanting them, all right? Whereby axons of surviving neurons grow new branches that make connections me, in new areas, okay? So it's basically like pruning a bush back as, as far as what you can get it and leaving a couple of teeny tiny sprouts 
and then replanting those sprouts, okay, so that it can grow and flourish on its own. So axonal sprouting is really, really easy to understand, especially if you just use that kind of metaphor for kind of weeds and gardens and stuff. So axonal sprouting, axons of surviving branches make new connections. Neurogenesis, so you basically grow a new set, right, which again is weird and wonderful. Okay, your brain knows that if it's lost certain cells, it needs to grow some more. And it won't recover them all, but if you go through stem cell treatment, it will recover them all. So everybody's capable of recovering some of those neurons through neurogenesis, but if you go through stem cell treatment, we can attempt to, to recover them all. And then you've got homologous area adaptation, which is the last one. And we've already done this one. Homologous means matching. And it's what happens when, or if you had to have, a hemispherectomy. It's where the opposite side of your brain picks up the function of the side that's died. Right. So a similar or equivalent area of your brain in the opposite hemisphere would carry out the function of the damaged area. So for example, the somatosensory cortex, which remember runs straight across the top of your parietal lobe there, your fingertips are kind of down here somewhere. If you had damage to that area, then the other side of the brain, through a modulus area adaptation, it would pick it up so that you're not always experiencing numbness, okay? It would swap it across and it would be able to recover in that sense, all right? So you've got this functional recovery occurs in those three different ways, axonal sprouting, neurogenesis, and homologous area adaptation. So, these mechanisms allow the functions of the damaged area to continue and what's most bizarre is that it's often totally as normal. So you've experienced brain damage but your brain will recover so that nobody would ever be able to tell that there was anything wrong with you. Okay? Which I think, I know it's massively geeky, but I think it's pretty amazing. Why do we have it all then? Why, why, why do we have it all if we can function exactly the same half of it? Mm, well, some people argue that you don't need it. Some people argue that over the period, over kind of like our evolution, you, our brain developed way beyond its demands. All right, there were excess connections and excess areas that we just didn't need at all, and that we're now in the process of shrinking, reversing back. Especially now that we're so dependent, technology. Yeah, our brains are probably going to start shrinking. Especially, and it's quite worrying, the areas of the brain responsible for memory. Because there is zero need nowadays to have memory of information like we used to have. Because everything's just transferable. And even if you forget anything, what do you do? Pick up your phone and it's there for you. So our brains probably will start, revert, not in our lifetime, not in the next lifetime, or the one after that, but they'll probably start shrinking back on themselves. We will be the end of our own creation, I reckon. So last couple of bits, guys, last few minutes, is just these final evaluation points. So we're now just on to the criticisms. So in relation to functional recovery, it sounds amazing, but there is a but, okay? And that is because functional recovery should be manageable for everyone, but it isn't. It's dependent on a series of factors. Notably, we've got age and IQ. So you can see there the tuba study found that recovery from brain damage in soldiers was way more likely, so 60% of them showed improvement if they were under the age of 20 years old. And then if you compare it, just stop a second if you had up. If you compare it to those people who were only slightly older, 
26 years old, only 20% of them showed improvement. Now that's a staggering difference. That's how much six years worth of development, that's how much of an impact that has on your ability to show a functional recovery. So who would have not a very good chance of showing functional recovery? Um. Yeah. So it's, it looks like there's light at the end of the tunnel because you talk about it all and you go, oh yeah, everybody's capable of functional recovery. But when you take into consideration that, that the functional recovery deteriorates with age, somebody has a stroke when they're 75, 80 years old, they'll recover some of it, but their brain's been pruned so much that you're going to struggle to get all those connections back. So age is a huge factor. It's not impossible, but it's less possible. And then Schneider said that recovery was due to, I said IQ, he actually calls it good education. So the more educated you are, the more recovery, or more chance of recovery you're going to have. Okay, so those who achieve a disability-free recovery, what do you think that means? Patients who achieve a disability-free recovery. Absolutely back to normal. Absolutely back to normal. Found that 40% of those patients had 16 years in the education system compared to only 10% of those people had had less than 12 years of education. Do you think why that might be? Why the more educated you are, the better you, you are in terms of functional recovery? Because when you're learning new things, those, whatever you call it, that pruning, you've got more pruning new stimuli. Yeah, alright, so the more time you spent in education, the more synaptic connections will have been formed over that time, whereas the less time in education, it's, it's not going to be fantastic in terms of your ability to recover. And then the final, final bit is that we make out like plasticity is this wondrous uh, process, but it's not always perfect. All right? So, no, right, Ian. I didn't get the last thing. Where were you up to? You don't have to get it all done. You, I've sent this round to you, so you, you have got a chance to do it. And it's also in your booklet as well, so don't worry if it's not in there. So the effects of plasticity, like I said, it's you know touted as being this brilliant kind of like way to recover from brain damage and illness, um, but it's not always great. So we go here. Uh, prolonged use of recreational drugs causes brain reorganisation, um, which is plasticity. You would think that that's a good thing, but it actually results in. Am I not giving you? Mm -hmm. Oh, it's the and finally bit. Yeah, so the and finally, it doesn't always have positive effects. So I'm just giving you this one. I'm going to, I'm giving you space to write down the phantom limb syndrome. So taking recreational drugs should, if it's reorganising our brain cells, it should be a positive thing. But what actually happens is that it, it, it incurs poorer cognitive functioning and you are at increased risk of developing dementia in later life if you take those kinds of drugs. So your brain is being plastic, but it's going to have long-term consequences for you that are negative. And then the point that I wanted you to write down was that 60 to, uh, 60 to, 70, 60 to 80 sorry, percent of amputees develop what is known as phantom limb syndrome, where they still experience the sensation of a missing limb but they feel it the same as the last time they felt it. So, just think what that would mean for a second. I've told you it's normally experienced by veterans. If you think about their last moment with that limb, they're not going to be pleasant. So the brain is being superb because it's trying to reform itself. The somatosensory cortex is going on at the minute. I had an arm there yesterday. So it's giving you the sensation of having the limb, but all it can do is use the memory of the last time that you had that limb. 
So these people are going to keep going through those painful memories and painful um, sensations whilst the somatosensory cortex tries to make sense of the fact that it's no longer got that limb attached to it. So it's not always adaptive, all right? We think it's brilliant, but it might have some negative implications for some people. And then, I'm not gonna do it now, but if you wanna go back to it in your booklets, the um, question, again, it's this Lotta question where a grandmother had had a stroke on her left side in her motor cortex and in Broca's area. Um, it's asking you um, why she might not be able to recover. All right, so you could maybe have a go at that question as well. So we've done an awful lot there in the space of less than a typical lesson. So I hope it's kind of helped you go back over some stuff. Apologies for kind of getting a bit irate at the start. It's just that I'm very aware of the fact that it is on your assessment. And it, you came in and you were all just like, don't know exactly what I'm doing. So you need to, I think, go back to that first little bit on localisation of function. But um, yeah, I hope it's helped you. And I'll see you, I'll see you guys tomorrow and see you on Thursday. Are you on about this one, the circadian, or the big one that I gave you for all trading and infradian? Which one are you on about? That one. This one? Yeah. Um, if it's not, I can get one for you. Yeah, there we go. You're in one. There's one left. Now I've got to have the unpleasant experience of watching that back to myself. Don't really want to do that. But you know.